about how the business side of the rebalancing of U.S. policy toward Asia uh, can be implemented and, and carried out in ways that serve the interests of all concerned. Um, certainly, as the Obama administration explained, looking to Asia uh, with, with rebalancing, um, there are other elements in addition to the economic, commercial, and financial, namely the security side as well as the people-to-people -people or cultural and rule of law uh, set of components related to uh, the foreign policy of the United States toward that very dynamic region, which is East Asia and South Asia. I think Hong Kong is relevant to all the pieces of this puzzle, but in particular, uh, the administration in the United States is looking to Asia from an, through an economic prism. This is the area where American citizens' lives can be improved, where the quality of life um, is dependent on the economic engagement and as you heard from Under Secretary Sanchez this morning, uh, the Obama administration's ambitious goals with respect to improving American people's lives uh, are intimately tied up in Asia. And with us today, uh, Jim Thompson of um, Crown Worldwide has a really unique story to tell you about um, how American and Asian future and past come together. Uh, I'll, I'll not uh, steal his thunder, but uh, Jim is uh, one of those businessmen in, in Asia and in particular in Hong Kong who's not only been very successful and built a very successful company, but also gives to the community, to the American community and to the Hong Kong community both, uh, and, and as a sign of how you really need to do business in Asia these days. And, and Silas uh, Cho is also uh, here on the, on the dais with me, someone who can tell you about how to, to build a business from the ground up and uh, a, a person who, in the textile and apparel, vertically integrated uh, systems, a wide range of, of very uh, dynamic and, and successful companies can tell you a, a bit about how it is that um, you can emulate success. So with that, Jim, may I ask you to get started? Well, thank you, Jim. And uh, for me, this is, uh, this is like coming home. I'm glad to be back here in New York. I was born in Jersey City. Uh, a couple of miles from here, and uh, I always remember my mom saying that you were born closer to the Statue of Liberty than uh, than New Yorkers were. It's always been a sore point, I think, back here. But I grew up in Bayonne, and as I was I was growing up, uh, my dad didn't. Uh, we didn't have much money in our family, and my dad used to talk about the American dream and finding the American dream. Well, my story is about finding the American dream in Hong Kong, and it's been quite quite a trip. I was actually drawn to Asia just after I finished college out in California, and I had been to Japan a couple of times, so that was the place I really wanted to go. And so I went to Japan as a 23-year-old, so this year represents my 50th year of living in Asia, and uh, it's, it's hard to believe I've been over there 50 years, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. When I, when I was quite young, when I was about 25 years old, I started a company in Japan, which is in the moving and storage business, but also we now do some other things, which I'll mention in a minute. But after five years of operating in Japan, we, we then decided to expand to Hong Kong. So we actually started the business in Hong Kong in 1970. It was a very unique time. The Cultural Revolution had just ended in China, and there were a lot of people moving into Hong Kong at that time. But for me, it was an amazing enlightenment because having lived and worked in Japan, which is a great country and, and uh, has many great attributes, but when I got to Hong Kong, it was, it was like this breath of fresh air in terms of doing business and, and just the entire environment was there. One of, one of the things I heard mentioned this morning was, I think Ronnie said something about everybody's welcome. Well, it really is true that in Hong Kong, it is sort of nationality blind. They, no one cares where you came from or what your nationality is, but everyone is treated fairly. And one of the things I found, uh, our company was very successful in Hong Kong and we expanded initially around Southeast Asia and then to other parts of the world. So today we're in 60 countries, we're, we have about 245 operations. So in, on that basis, I think I have a good uh, experience in what it's like to establish a business in these many different countries of the world. And in all the places we have opened up, 
Many of them have great advertisements about how welcome foreign investment is. We have never seen anything to match the, uh, the freedom of doing business in Hong Kong. And I guess that's why Hong Kong is consistently named the, Hong Kong's, the, the world's freest economy. But we've got into situations in some countries where corruption was a huge problem. We don't have that in Hong Kong. We got into places where there were so many taxes hidden in and obvious taxes. And again, uh, as the chief executive said, the tax rate is extremely low in Hong Kong at a flat 16%. And we got into places uh, that ha had other uh, issues, sort of uh, social costs of doing business and, and the ability to operate freely and, and to dismiss people who are not performing. Uh, and in some parts of Europe, it's almost impossible, and even in South America, to do that. In Hong Kong, we, we don't have that problem. We, we treat our employees fairly, and if there's a time when someone is dismissed, uh, the laws are, are fair. So there were so many attributes that we found as we developed the business that around the world that there was no question that uh, Hong Kong would be the, the, the headquarters for our company in every location. And I know that a lot's been said about that today as to uh, the ease of doing business and, um, and, and that, that sort of thing. But one of the attributes that we found too about Hong Kong was that uh, is the people, and I think it was just touched on, but I think this is something that has to be stressed. The people of Hong Kong uh, have been, are some of the most um, hardworking and adaptable people that I've ever come in contact with. And I think one great example of that is um, when I got there, when I moved there in 1978, uh, the economy was largely built around manufacturing. There was a lot of manufacturing in, of various products in the, in the factories of Hong Kong. But as China opened, uh, these uh, astute factory owners immediately moved their manufacturing across the border, mainly to Guangdong, especially for the lower priced uh, commodities. And so we suddenly had a situation that in, in many cases would be, in many places would be very uh, problematic where you have lots of unskilled labor uh, who were seeing their industry disappear or their jobs disappear. But in Hong Kong, uh, the adaptability of the people was such that these, there was very, very little uh, uh, unemployment. In fact, most of these people found jobs in the service industry. Today we're primarily a service economy and the people who might have been working on an assembly line of some sort, you know, might then be working in, in hotels or other industries. And I, I found that amazing in terms of the adaptability of a people. And throughout all that, that process from the 80s and 90s and, and the 2000 years, uh, Hong Kong's continued to operate uh, smoothly and actually has had a budget surplus throughout most of that time. So I can say that uh, without question, it, it, is, it is the best place in the world uh, to operate. And certainly from my company's perspective, we have had uh, tremendous success in, in working there. Uh, the, the issue of the, the taxes, I think that has to be stressed because the tax efficiency uh, on the way the government works allows us to be able to retain the majority of our profits and then actually we can do what we want with them. In my case, we've chosen to reinvest them. So I can, the expansion of our company around the world really emanates from a lot of the profits that we've made in Hong Kong. And even today, today we divide our, the company into three regions. We, the Asia-Pacific region, the EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa region, and also, um, also the, uh, the Americas here, and including South America. But there's no question that the best profitability for our company has certainly come out of, uh, out of the Asia-Pacific region, and that's allowed us to generate a lot of capital re to reinvest in our, in our businesses. Uh, the other thing I would, I would mention, and I think it was talked about in the last panel, was that this is really the Asian century. The activity, and since I've been there a long time, I think I can speak on this subject with some authority, the activity that we're seeing throughout Asia is pr pretty amazing. Obviously, China's the big engine of all this, is driving all the, uh, the growth, and has been for the last several decades. But I think that uh, those young people, particularly that are coming out there, see a future, and these are, are people from all over the world, 
they see a future for the next two, three, four decades, or maybe the entire century, where Asia is going to be a major driver for jobs and for uh, economic activity and for entrepreneurship as well. There's going to be a lot of opportunities there for, uh, for new young people to start up new businesses, just as I did, you know, 50 years ago. And, and I see that as a driving force going forward. And, and, um, and I think that, uh, you know, most, uh, more and more people are, are starting to recognize that this is, the, this is the place to be in the Far East. But I would also say, as many of the other speakers have said today, that uh, because of the way Hong Kong operates, there's no question that that would be the place to base yourself if you were going to do business in China or if you were going to do business in any other part of, of Asia Pacific. In our case, it's global, and, and we would never change our headquarters from the, uh, the global uh, location that we have. The, the government policies of Hong Kong, which I guess goes back to when it was a British colony, um, were very open and fair. And I was, I think when the, when the transition came in 1997, there was a genuine concern. It was, would these change? Would there be a higher tax rate? Would there be more, more bureaucracy? And now we've had uh, something like 16 years since the handover, and I'm happy to say that there has been no change since that uh, handover has taken place. In fact, in some of the cases, you could say the change is even for the better, particularly because China has opened up and created a lot of new opportunities for us. So my story is one that, uh, as I say, finding the American dream in Asia, and it's been a tremendous success, and I, I love to tell it, and I think that the opportunities remain there for many companies, whether you be small operators or, or big companies. Obviously, many of the big companies are there already. But the, the uh, opportunities continue there. And I would really encourage those of you who are uh, even thinking about uh, setting up a representative office or a, a small office or whatever to, to look at Hong Kong. Uh, one of the things that uh, the, chief, the chief executive mentioned, and I just wanted to elaborate on one bit, is the the thing that was called the Closer Economic Partnership Arrangement between Hong Kong and China. And just to explain that a little bit, that both Hong Kong and China, and, and, and Taiwan as well, are separate members of the World Trade Organization. And as such, any two members can join into a, a free trade agreement with each other. And while this is not called exactly a free trade agreement, it does work that way, where China and Hong Kong entered into a formal agreement uh, to become, uh, uh, to operate as uh, under this closer economic partnership agreement. And what it meant to my company was that w we had been operating in China as a representative office, which was, had a lot of restrictions in what we could do. But by getting into the, uh, the SEPA program and qualifying as a SEPA company, we were then able to uh, operate in China uh, almost as a Chinese company. We were able to own land and we were able to buy equipment and, and hire people, and it really enhanced our ability to, to build the business. So that's another huge advantage for foreign companies, for any companies, really, in terms of operating from Hong Kong. And uh, Ambassador, I think I'll leave it at that and uh, let Silas have some words, and maybe we can have some questions uh, later. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. And it, it's important to keep in mind the historical perspective. Uh, you know, there are so many who come to Hong Kong now and actually don't think much about 1997 anymore. And it wasn't that way before, and certainly there were you know, many of us here who were around when there were concerns about what would happen in, in the tran transition and then afterwards. But Silas, you lived through that period and, and certainly have thrived and emblematic of what many companies have done in Hong Kong since 1997. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, look, I'm Silas Chow. I'm from Hong Kong. Obviously, you're looking at my face, there's no mistake. <laughs> but Hong Kong is such a special place that in Hong Kong, you not only having Chinese faces, we have Jim Thompson there for over 50 years, and an ambassador there for many 15 years. Hong Kong is an open place for everybody. And today, I think everybody here in the audience want to hear the Hong Kong story. But the best is for you go to Hong Kong, experience the Hong Kong uh, um, uh, uh, story. Everybody has said today 
um, many speakers, all the advantage of Hong Kong. I also want to take on um, Jim Thompson's dream. He had an American dream. So I'm from Hong Kong. Very early on, I came here and pursued the American dream. And thanks to Hong Kong, only because of Hong Kong, I had a competitive advantage of both New York City, which is American marketplace, Hong Kong as a manufacturing base, and to supply all the products that American consumer wanted. So Hong Kong was fundamental and critical to most of the business in the United States in the consumer market in the last 30 years. And I know in the audience, a lot of people is in this business, and somewhere, somehow, you had contact with Hong Kong. Hong Kong was fundamental and critical to the, your success. But today, there's more than one American dream. Today, we are talking about a China dream. All the Chinese people like America. So I want to convince to you here, most American friends, is Chinese really love you. Chinese drink Coca-Cola, Chinese eat Kentucky chicken, Chinese wear American jeans, American t-shirt, and they even wear American baseball upside down. <laughs> so you will be very welcome. The um, Chinese dream is not only for China. Exactly like American dream was not only for the Americans. In this audience, many people from all different parts of the world, you come to America, you realize their dreams. But today, we're starting talking about the China dream. China dream is definitely open to everybody. And for you, try to come to join us in China to fulfill a China dream, you have to come through Hong Kong because Hong Kong is the gateway to China. Today in the United States is still the biggest consumer market. You have 300 million people, have over 180 million middle class people who is in the affordable luxury sector consuming all the products in America. China today already has 170 million middle class. And in the next 20 to 30 years, that number is bound to double to 540 million middle class consumers, which by that time will be bigger than the United States. But the more important is not only the size, it's the speed of growth of China market in the next 20 to 30 years. Now, if you all believe a second dream in your life, the China dream, you have to go to come to Hong Kong. The reason is very simple. Actually, all the decision makers in business from China, they are in Hong Kong. They all come to live in Hong Kong. Their children go to school in Hong Kong. They buy apartments in Hong Kong. And decision making is all in Hong Kong. So if you really want to share the China group, uh, dream, try to be part of that, come to Hong Kong. And with that, I give back to Ambassador and uh, we answer some questions. Thank you, thank you both. Um, to, to start the questioning off, I, I might address to both of you, um, in keeping with the theme uh, of the conference, which is Think Asia, Think Hong Kong, um, there are a, a number of countries in the region that have policies aimed not unlike the United States, toward um, taking advantage of the dynamism uh, of East Asia. So India has its look east policy, and Southeast Asia, of course, is becoming more integrated with Northeast Asia. Uh, for both of you, uh, could you comment for a moment on Hong Kong's uh, relationship from an economic and commercial and financial perspective, not only to China, uh, but also to the rest of Asia, and how Hong Kong is integrating itself into uh, the, the goals and objectives of um, Southeast Asia and South Asia in particular? Uh, well, I'll start by, by saying, yeah, the, the, 
There are, the dynamicism of, of Southeast Asia is, is fantastic. I mean, we're doing so well now in countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, and, and it's, it's so close to Hong Kong. It's just a couple of hours flight down there. But I, I also wanted to use one example, because one of the businesses that I have in, in Hong Kong is, is a wine business, and uh, wine storage is, is really our facet of it. We have uh, some underground bunkers that we've converted into a restaurant. And in this, uh, just to give you an example of how Hong Kong operates, throughout most of the countries of Asia, and India being probably the, the worst in terms of tariffs on wine, uh, Hong Kong actually has no tariff on wine. It is absolutely free. You can bring in unlimited quantities, and it's zero duty. And I, I always thought that this was an interesting thing for the Hong Kong government to do. It's almost as if the government acted as an entrepreneur themselves. Because what they did about five or six years ago, they said, uh, we are collecting a certain amount of duty on wine. And I can't remember the number, but it, was, it wasn't too significant. But it was a few, uh, maybe a few billion Hong Kong dollars. Uh, but they said, we will sacrifice that because we believe if we take all the tax and all the duties off wine, that we can make Hong Kong a wine hub. And that's exactly what they did. So what happened was that uh, suddenly all the wine auctions, including many from here in New York, all the wine auctions started to take place in Asia. The wine collectors started to bring their wine collections from the UK and other places where they had them stored into Hong Kong. And suddenly Hong Kong became the wine center of, uh, of uh, all of Asia and, and actually one of the key wine centers of the world right now even though, of course, we don't make any wine anywhere in Hong Kong or even in Southeast Asia. China is having some wine. And I thought that that was a good indication of how the Hong Kong government works. So to come back to your question, Jim, I think that it, it's, uh, it's, it's the Asian circle of companies, countries, even the Philippines and some of the ones that have been lagging in the past, are really coming good. I think Myanmar will be a great place, but Hong Kong still, be, in my view, still becomes the place that you regionalize your business from, from those locations. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's a, the whole market, China to the north and all these countries to the south, are going to be opportunities galore for investors or small enterprises to go. But uh, certainly, I, I will continue to speak forever about Hong Kong being the place to headquarter. Well, thanks, thanks Jim. And, and Silas, I'll turn to you and, and note that not unlike the structural, structural shift that's coming, um, in, in China, moving, as, as William Fung uh, articulated very well earlier this morning, from an export-driven to consumer-driven uh, economy in a country like Indonesia, it's already very heavily driven by the consumer side and a big country that's expanding its, its middle class, too, like China. And Indonesia is ahead of others in Southeast Asia, but that's the coming trend. So there'll be markets there for textiles and apparel, for consumer goods. And Jim, I should mention, I, you know, I, I admire your, your creativity as a kid in Hong Kong. I used to play in those underground bunkers, which were left over from, from the war. And you know, it w never would have occurred to me to create a restaurant out of one. But Silas, please. Look, um, today's theme is Think Asia, Think Hong Kong. There's nothing more appropriate that, as everybody said, the rest of Asia is rising also. Indonesia, Thailand, India, Southeast Asia, everywhere. Even Burma is starting to take off. But I can give you one fact. Most of these Asian, Southeast Asian countries are dominated by Chinese residents over there. These are the Chinese merchants. And where they live? They all live in Hong Kong. <laughs> so, and all those countries want to do business somewhere, somehow, with China. Either go to the China market or buy from China. And where they go through? They go through Hong Kong. So, think Asia, think Hong Kong. It's not, it's more than appropriate. Whatever you want to think, China, India, the rest of Asia, including Japan, come to Hong Kong. That best place for you to do your business. So now we're collecting questions from the audience, so please everyone 
Um, feel free to continue to, to hand your Q&A forms in. Um, Silas, the first question for you, um, and it reads as follows. Can you relate Michael Kors' decision to locate its headquarters in Hong Kong to this event's theme? Yes. Um, as I said earlier, I'm from Hong Kong. So all the business I do around the world is headquartered in Hong Kong. Not only bullshitting, but the real. <laughs> That's why whenever you see Michael Kors communication coming out on Wall Street, it says Hong Kong-based Michael Kors. So I did it with um, uh, um, my previous uh, company, Tommy Hilfiger, headquartered Hong Kong. Because, like everybody already said, there's so much advantages of Hong Kong as a financial center, as a service center, as a very efficient take tax base. And uh, even now, I'm bringing all these brand names to China. It's still headquartered Hong Kong. So think everywhere you want to go. Even think the United States. Come to Hong Kong. And, and <clears throat> excuse me, the next question is, is for both panelists. Um, and the question is, is the following statement true? Um, has the United States, uh, with, with respect or vis-a-vis -vis China, Hong Kong, and Asia, abdicate the role of leadership since they don't have the focus on secondary education that Asian countries do? Well, I don't, I don't know if they've abdicated the, the relationship, but I, I will say this about Hong Kong. Uh, in 1968, we had one university in Hong Kong, and today we have eight universities. And I do a lot of mentoring for the students, and I speak to the students at the universities a lot, and these are really sharp kids. And we work on, uh, you know, things like making the universities more international. But just to give you an example, uh, the EMBA program of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology is rated as the number one executive MBA program in the world. And that's rated by the, the Financial Times of England. And also their particular MBA program itself is in the top 10. So there's no question that the education, uh, the focus on education in Hong Kong has been, uh, has been very, very strong. Uh, the other thing that's a, a big advantage uh, education-wise is that as you could see from the panelists today and from the people, a lot of people here from Hong Kong in the audience, English is, is still prevalent in Hong Kong. People would thought that it would fade off, and maybe to a certain extent it did fade off in terms of, uh, you know, the education process, but it's come back now, I think, and having a country where English is spoken, because that's the language of business, it's the language of education, it's the language of everything. And, and I should say that of these eight universities, I think I'm correct in saying that they're all taught in English, which is quite amazing when you're in a, in a, country, a place like Hong Kong, why they don't uh, teach in Cantonese or even Mandarin, but these universities are all taught in English. So I don't think America is, uh, gonna, is, is abdicating its position. Let's face it, it's a much bigger country and there are still a lot of uh, Hong Kong students who come back to, ed to be educated here and a lot of Chinese students that come back. So there's some great universities in, uh, in America that will be turning out uh, great graduates uh, and, and hopefully they'll come back to Hong Kong as well after they've graduated like Silas here. But I, I do think that uh, it, it is a, an area where a lot more emphasis should be placed in, in the public education system in the United States because uh, we will slip behind here in the U.S. if, uh, if we don't do that. It's certainly something that the U.S. leadership has, has adv advocated, that is, investment in infrastructure, which of course includes education. Um, another question, and this one for the, the, the entire panel, uh, focused on uh, the cost of doing business in Hong Kong. And the question reads, while Hong Kong, Hong Kong is an attractive business heaven, the cost uh, of living in Hong Kong has skyrocketed, especially real estate, and this has become prohibitive. How do you see that this can be rebalanced? Silas, will you begin? You know, cost is always related to demand. When everyone wanna come to Hong Kong, there's so much demand, the cost goes up a little bit. But like in New York City, 
um, cost in Hong Kong can be very much moderated. If you don't want to live on it, up east side, you don't have to live on the middle levels. You live in the new towns of Sha Tin and new territories because it's very effective and we have great um, public transportation, underground and, uh, and the light uh, uh, trains. So the cost is really depend on the demand. And thank God we have so much demand for Hong Kong. And you all, please come quickly. Otherwise, you'll be crowded out. <laughs> I, I would just add to that. It, it, actually, he's exactly right. We've got too much of a good thing. We have too much. Be, too, and, and a lot of demand has been driven by the mainland Chinese. And you heard this morning about how, how wealthy they have become. And uh, a lot of them want to have a place in Hong Kong. And they'll spend large amounts of money. So they have driven up the, uh, the price of real estate. I think that in answer to the question, one of the equalizers uh, has to do with our low tax rate. And here, using New York, maybe the New York prices haven't reached the Hong Kong level as yet, but you do have a lot of taxes here, city taxes, state taxes, government, federal taxes. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of is an equalizer in, in itself in terms of uh, housing demand. Uh, but, but the infrastructure aspects, as is, is, uh, Silas mentioned, he, you know, just getting around in Hong Kong and all that, there, it is really uh, a great, I would say, a bargain in many ways compared to many of the other far less efficient places in the United States. So I, I think if you were to balance it out, and, and I guess I should also say that the government of Hong Kong has recognized the fact that some of the young people graduating from, from universities, young couples and this sort of thing, uh, are a little bit priced out of the market at the moment. And they are doing something about it. They are saying, there, and this is not typical of Hong Kong, because usually it's such a laissez-faire economy that no one, the, the government doesn't involve themselves. But when they see their own people, the Hong Kong people, in this, uh, in this dilemma of not being able to buy even a small apartment, I think that they have now put in a tax on foreign buyers. Uh, and I, I have to say, I probably was mainly directed at the mainland more than anyone else, uh, so that the local buyers, the local young couples, and the local people who, who can now aff afford it will, will have an advantage in, in it being able to find uh, a place to live. So the government did see the problem and intervene, uh, which is very unusual for Hong Kong, but they saw it had to be done. No, it's a very good point that, you know, the, obviously this uh, depends on demand, and it, it raises the uh, awareness that on the mainland the economy is undergoing structural change and Beijing has, has successfully, I think, downshifted now from the two decades of 10% uh, per year growth and is really looking more at 7 to 8% growth. That um, really, it, it seems to me, emphasizes the need for assistance in dealing with a more complicated economy over on the mainland side and presents some opportunities for uh, for, for Hong Kong along the lines of what we've been talking about. The, the next question, and we might have, have time for one more after this, or this might be the last one, but depending on uh, how long it takes to answer. The, the question is, can you explain any progress on making Hong Kong a centralized location for business arbitration? And the background here is that uh, there's been you know, quite a lot of discussion about Hong Kong as uh, a, a place where, the, grounded in the rule of law, with an independent judiciary, where um, the bureaucracy works and therefore business disputes, disputes can be handled. Um, Jim, would you like to take a first crack at that? Well, yeah, Hong Kong is actually uh, has an active uh, effort to become an arbitration center for the region and, and it is for the, the reason that Jim just mentioned that we have, a, we have a, the most incredible, incredibly effective rule of law. I'm not sure how many of you be aware of this, but a lot of the judges in Hong Kong are, are not Hong Kong Chinese. They're from Australia, England, New Zealand and that sort of thing. And they grew up in the, in the English common law system and they, they adjudicate cases. But I think that uh, it's realized and should be realized more in every society that a lot of uh, cases shouldn't even end up in court. They should be, their disputes between people, that's gonna happen to the end of time. But some of them can, go, can be dealt with in an arbitration setting rather than in a, in a, a legal uh, court setting. And I think that uh, the, the effort has been underway for quite some time to make Hong Kong an arbitration center. So certainly we do have 
good qualified arbitrators uh, already, and so uh, I think more and more more and more uh, disputes will come under this system, and it is it is in process, and I think it will be the arbitration center for Asia. Well, Silas, so please. Yeah. Hong Kong has a great rule of law, and uh, everybody knows Hong Kong law is uh, based on English common law. However, for us, what matters is commercial practices. Business today, Hong Kong is full of American lawyers. They give you all the exactly common uh, 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 practice as here in New York City. So, as Jane said, ultimately, you don't even want to go to arbitration. The lawyers settle everything, and all the American lawyers are there. So you can pick it and take any one of them for our business. Well, you, you've had a chance to just uh, sort of scratch the surface with two very successful entrepreneurs in Hong Kong and two different stories, you know, one uh, of building a, a global business in Hong Kong and powering it through uh, the, the success that the Hong Kong environment creates. And, and another, uh, a story of integration with the, the Chinese economy and taking full advantage of what Hong Kong offers in terms of the connection across the border into the Pearl River Delta. Um, I, I ask you please now to, uh, as we draw to a close, give a warm round of applause to our two panel members. <laughs>